My name is Zena Koetem. Uh, I am Lebanese, uh, originally from Beirut. Um, I do think of myself as an architect, although increasingly a lot of the work I do is uh, multimedia and multidisciplinary in some ways. Um, so I think of myself as also a designer and they don't necessarily go in hand in hand, sometimes they do. Um, I'm also principal of a LA-based architecture firm called Millions uh, with my partner John May. Well, maybe, maybe to answer the question, I should probably uh, tell you about my trajectory a little bit because in some ways I've lived in many places and uh, perhaps maybe that what, that's what makes it hard for me to, again, decide which city I long to the most. Um, I think that there's no doubt that Beirut will always be my city and always be the kind of the built nostalgia in my mind, for sure. Um, but uh, I've lived in Kuwait, uh, I've lived in Paris, I've lived in Spain, uh, in a tiny city called Olot, uh, north of Barcelona. I've lived in Canada, Toronto, um, and then multiple cities in the US. So it's relatively diverse uh, in that sense. Um, and I've, I feel like I've always kind of been, um, uh, I've felt at home or been attracted to certain things uh, in, certain, in, in certain cities and, and then kind of rejected or have not felt um, related to other things in, in the same city. So, um, so in some ways it's not one place, but many parts of m many places that um, I feel like I'm uh, related to. Um, Increasingly, I've been I've been in LA for a while now, and increasingly, where I live uh, has become uh, home in some ways, and also um, the diversity of Los Angeles and where we live in Topanga, both at a kind of like um, uh, both the diversity of the topography, the diversity of the culture, diversity of the culinary uh, culture as well, the, which is related. Um, to different ethnic groups in Los Angeles, but also diversity of its landscape, I think is something that really um, is interesting for me. And I ended up in the US via Canada. I, uh, I lived in Toronto for about five or six years. And um, I moved there uh, initially for studies. And, um, and then I ended up staying. Um, I taught at the University of Toronto for a few years. Um, and then I decided to do another master's uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design uh, and haven't really left uh, the U.S. since, actually. So from Boston, I then moved in Los Angeles. But, um, but actually, I met my partner, my current uh, Millions partner, John, in Canada. Um, he was a visiting uh, faculty there, and we were teaching at the same time. So. We started working together um, sort of remotely, let's say. Um, he was flying from Los Angeles um, momentarily, and then I was there. And, uh, and so in the end, we decided that we wanted uh, the office to be here and our life to be here. And so I think there was a moment when I started, when I started teaching at the University of Toronto when I realized that perhaps that's something I'd like to do um, more of and uh, that I'd like to combine with my own practice. Um, and, uh, and I was interested in um, uh, sort of developing my expertise in a specific direction, uh, both for my own practice, but also um, for my sort of intellectual and academic practice. Um, so I was interested in doing, um, essentially I, I did a, a degree in computation, so it was a sort of a specialty, let's say, in technology. Um, and it, um, and the GSC offered basically the degree I was I was thinking about. And at the time, I, I was deciding between MIT and GSD, which were two amazing schools, of course. Um, and I finally settled uh, for the GSD for various reasons. Uh, and um, and then, strangely, that relationship sort of developed. I I then taught there um, after graduating. I 
I taught at USC actually um, be, when I graduated and then I started at GSD and uh, taught there for a number of years before SciArc, yeah. So it's interesting this question because I, um, as someone who did not truly have their professional training in North America, um, often people ask me this question because they're kind of curious uh, where I'm, I'm coming from, uh, what's my influence or um, who I worked with or things like that where um, naturally I'm sure in any city or in any country there's um, perhaps a, a kind of a turnover from generation to generation you start to see uh, similar ideas being developed perhaps. Um, uh, so I think for me uh, because I, I've had this kind of um, multi-city kind of experience and training um, you cannot really pinpoint my uh, influence to one person in some ways and a lot of the time um, when you're you know because I'm Middle Eastern I'm an Arab woman an Arab Muslim woman I am uh, but also I have a francophone family I um, it, it's a strange mix of um, culture that uh, it's, it would be very hard for me to kind of say, oh, I, this particular mentor, American mentor or European mentor, I relate to 100% uh, and has taught me all of these things. Um, so there are, of course, immediate mentors that I can think of, like um, at GSD, for example, Andrew Witt uh, was absolutely a mentor as someone who has navigated both um, the practice in the real world and, and also the, um, the experimental nature of technology. And I think that, you know, he was my advisor and, um, and we developed a really uh, a great relationship. Interestingly, we work very differently. Um, and, and if you see, you know, if you look up his work, he's a kind of a master in, um, in, uh, in building technology. Um, I have a very different kind of practice and also very different aesthetic interests and uh, but there are overlaps and uh, so that was that was really um, let's say informative and a kind of learning experience for me um, and then there are architects of course that I worked for like I worked for Ereseira Architectus and um, they recently won the Pritzker but at the time when I, I worked with them I thought that their structure was really interesting and it, it it's, has definitely influenced the way I've thought about my own office, like the fact that it's a collaborative structure, um, the fact that one of the partners is a, is a woman, um, and that she's an equal partner, um, the, also the, they've pursued interests that are um, their own and um, they've run their practice in a completely unknown town literally a village of uh, barely 2,000 people um, near a kind of a volcano, a uh, dormant volcano. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's, it was very strange to, to work there and, and imagine a su potentially productive and successful firm that kind of doesn't care about where it is or, or the external validation, let's say, of a city or anything in a city. Um, so I think that they were quite influential in that sense. Um, and then there are lots of other practices that are, um, even in Los Angeles, that are admire, um, like Johnson Markley, for example, also a collaborative practice between Sharon and um, Mark, and, um, or in New York, uh, Soil, for example, a collaborative practice between Florin and Jing Liu. Um, so there are lots of um, things like that that sort of are a mix. I think most of my influence and my uh, perhaps mentor in my mind are not people I know. <laughs> and those are in some ways my true mentors. Uh, and they don't tend to be architects. Um, it's kind of a mixed fragment of people. Um, I, was, I was asked recently to write an essay for the student journal here at SciArc and and they were like, okay, you write whatever you want to write about uh, is great. And I was, was kind of looking at my desk and I literally saw a frag, like a fragment of books and, 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 um, and novels and fiction. And 
and then things on my desktop as well and a lot of them were multimedia and multi-generation and multi-gender and but also multi-culture and I realized that um, if you know to answer your question that it's, it's in some ways a list of people uh, a list of books like I I admire John Didion uh, very much um, uh, there's a Lebanese Palestinian artist I admire called Mona Hatoum, uh, who's mostly sculpture, a sculptor. Um, uh, I also, from the, f the, the 15th century, uh, Aisha Taimur, who's a, a Muslim um, uh, Egyptian uh, writer uh, who completely, essentially, it was the beginning of feminism, that she sort of started the beginning of feminism in Egypt. Um, and it's not that I sort of identify with particular cultures, it's more that I identify with the energy and the kind of productive energy of certain personalities, like uh, like novelists and, and artists. I really admire Matthew Barney's work and the kind of intensity of the work and the intensity of the book proje uh, the production. Um, so it's really just a, a kind of like a collection. It's a loose, actually, it's a loose collection. And, and it's not very far off from how we work, actually, in my office. It tends to be a loose collection of, of objects and images and texts and digital and physical and materials. And, um, and there's not a kind of simple or direct way of linking them in some ways. Um, and I feel like. It's the same way in my own work. There's not a simple, direct way of finding perhaps my influence um, or linking it to one person or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed, even when you asked me about my mentors, it's like, um, I mean, the arts and literature are their own bubble for sure, but, um, but in some ways I definitely am interested in culture first and foremost. Um, and again, there's no direct translation there's no instrumental way of taking culture and making it architecture and there's no instrumental way of taking architecture and making it culture it's much more complex but um, but I am interested in, in in having that conversation um, it's more challenging it's harder ha having worked in Europe I and and I've realized that actually they're in and I still have a lot of relationship with uh, architect friends let's say uh, in Europe and the way they started their own practice is very different than the way we are are kind of building our practice here. Um, in Europe, you have access to, to competitions that, of course, get built. <laughs> Whereas in the US, um, most of the competitions out there are ideas competitions, and they're um, a lot of time a waste of time, frankly. Um, so we don't really do those. <laughs> uh, we don't do competitions. Um, uh, we do sp some speculative work, meaning we've uh, we've come up with projects that kind of don't, let's say, have a client. Um, and we find those to be very um, kind of intellectually um, interesting for us. Um, but interestingly, uh, recently we won a competition <laughs> in the US, uh, which is a very rare thing um, and, a, and a quite kind of radical, um, let's say, scenario uh, in the last decades uh, in the US let's say so we um, we were finalists in the summer for a competition to reimagine uh, a part of the uh, Everson Museum designed by I.M. Pei uh, in Syracuse um, and uh, the brief was really interesting it was an invited competition and um, the brief was really interesting it was essentially uh, Basically, uh, this donor, Louise Rosenfield, donated about 3,000 pieces of ceramics to the Everson Museum. Um, and so all of a sudden they have 3,000 pieces that they have to um, somehow visually archive and visually display. But not only that, um, the, the donor, Louise Rosenfield, had a stipulation. And her stipulation was that these pieces have to be used. They cannot just be displayed. The competition brief that we were part of, um, essentially, they came up with a brief which was a cafe, a kind of dining, let's say, experience in which um, uh, uh, museum visitors would use, could use these ceramics and actually drink from them and eat from them.
Um, and her collection is this super eclectic, mostly North American, mostly American actually, like Midwest and the Southwest mostly, uh, of living ceramicist that she's collected over the years. Uh, so you can eat from them. There's no food safety issue. and But they also are strange because they have these like very strange sort of aesthetic and figural shapes and colors and it's not something that an architect would from a first glance let's say uh, like but but when you look at them together they're kind of amazing I mean we were really fascinated by just the sheer number and visually how much <laughs> there were pieces and how different and we're working on this actively right now um, and that's a very rare opportunity on many levels in the US. Um, first, the fact that the invited firms were young firms, uh, which was, you know, we were really happy that that was um, considered and actually like, th that was very thoughtful, let's say, on the committee's point of view. Um, because again, like, there are certain firms that they get to a point and they start to kind of have access to lots of different projects, right? Um, but firms at our level, for example, they're not quite at yeah, that level to get all these kinds of projects. So, so in some ways, like this competition, which was um, in collaboration with the Syracuse Architecture School, um, they really did it very well. They they thought about all these things. They um, it was meant to promote and encourage young firms in the country to um, to sort of make a leap in their practice. And so we we're excited to be part of it on many levels. I mean, the fact that it's a project by I.M. Pei that in our, in our eyes is one of his best, actually. We really love that one. And uh, so that's an honor for sure. And then also the, the radical kind of idea of the collection to be used is really exciting. But more importantly, they've just really do done a very good job organizing this competition. and. Uh, and it was a sort of sigh of relief for most of our colleagues uh, who are extremely talented, who were part of this, um, who were finalists and who were invited in the first round and second round, um, that you know, young architecture firms in the US could participate in some ways. Um, but generally, yes, your instincts are correct. Um, there is almost like the gap between the, the young firm and the large firm is completely um, is larger and larger um, and it's as though there are no longer any breathing room for medium firms really uh, because of Answer and others um, and I would say a lot of the projects that we do and our colleagues do are tend to be also adaptive reuse I mean for many reasons tend to be interiors for many reasons and and this goes back to your question of like how do we define a young architecture firm in the US? What kind of work they do? And it's, you're right, it's strange because the, a lot of our colleagues, including us, we're doing furniture, we're doing interiors, we're doing retail, we're doing some residential, but mostly interior um, renovations. Uh, it's, it feels as though the ground up is, has become such a like novelty. Um, I was taught very differently than I teach, actually. and. Uh, um, because again, the, the masters I did, whether it was the masters at University of Toronto or, um, or the masters I did, uh, the post-professional at uh, the GSD, were very short. They were both um, like one was a year and the other was like barely a year and a half. Um, so of course I learned a lot, and of course it was a very enriching uh, education. But it's very different than let, let's say. Um, having, you know, a kind of four or five year training um, in a particular school, right, where you truly become, um, in some ways, uh, uh, not, I don't want to say the product, but, but essentially you are truly trained to think and work mm -hmm. in certain ways, and, and you develop your own course moving forward, but, but that there's no doubt that the influence is there. Um, so I think, even though I have had uh, educations in North America, I still feel sometimes uh, kind of foreign, uh, perhaps uh, in the way I work and in the way I, I, I teach or even um, 
just the academic culture sometimes does feel foreign. There's no doubt about that. Um, um, in, in some ways, I've self-taught a lot uh, to, to, to understand the, the kind of context um, of what, what is here and what is taught here and how things are taught. But, it, but also, it would be naive to say that maybe um, the history of academic architecture in the US and even in Europe has not influenced um, a school like the one I, I studied at in Beirut, uh, perhaps the intensity is, did not translate as much, but we, uh, there is a, there is literally, there's traces and memories of the Beaux-Arts and there's traces and memories of even the Texas Rangers and uh, in the way, like some of our professors have developed their assignments and all that. Um, there's so much cross-pollination too because um, I think a lot of professors who teach in the context of um, the Middle East tend to have graduate degrees from also Europe or the US. So there's a kind of inevitable cross-pollination. So it's not like I'm completely foreign to that. But um, Well, why don't I, I think maybe easier for sake of specificity to talk about the things I've taught. Um, so, and you'll find in our practice in millions, you'll see there's kind of um, multiple parallel pro projects that are happening at the same time. Um, and one of them is uh, essentially about imaging and about just the kind of the current culture of, of uh, computational images um, in our contemporary uh, workflows and, and sort of consciousness around that. Um, my partner has written a lot about it. Um, you may have. Uh, heard about it, I'm not sure, but um, he's just, just published a book called Signal Image Architecture. Um, and it, in some ways there's also kind of cross-pollination between the things I teach and the things he writes about and teaches about. Um, so for example, at GSD I taught uh, advanced seminars on pretty much what I, what I refer to as experiments in computer graphics um, and um, image making culture and uh, computationally. Um, and perhaps the the possible tectonics of images, or uh, maybe speculating on possible objects or even forms or materialities that can emerge from sim just rendering, perhaps, or other other techniques uh, of image manipulation. So these are things that are kind of site uh, more specific uh, sort of technical seminars that I have taught uh, at GSD. Um, that I'm sure I will also perhaps build on here. Um, and, and also the, these, are related, these questions are related to some of the more proto-experiments that we do in our own office, uh, millions, and they don't necessarily result in uh, architecture. In fact, the, a lot of the time they result in beautiful objects or maybe very ugly objects and then they, that may or may, may not translate into, uh, into build form, and maybe they shouldn't really. Uh, I'm not sure, but but they allow us to to learn about um, the sort of the contemporary landscape of the techniques uh, around us. Um, in some ways, we always the the seminar always did, also um, touches upon this idea that as architects, we're perpetual amateurs in some ways, or always learning and 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 taking on techniques from other fields. Uh, who are experts in their own fields, whether they're photographers or whether they're engineers or whether they're um, artists uh, in specific uh, media. Um, and we were, were very good at absorbing culture and kind of um, and figuring out what to do with these tools. And sometimes we even uh, borrow them from uh, the movie industry or, you know, whether it's post-production or, or pre-production or other like, you know, simply like After Effects or Photoshop to start with. Um, and then others that are more complicated, like 3D scanning or, um, or even now 3D, you know, 3D, 3D printing in the last decade or more. So part of the questions that I ask um, and that my partner also asks is, is it, what, how do we make sense of this? You know, like we used to have a kind of uh, stable system of representation. Uh, plans and sections, and and now we have an like an array and an explosion of um, of platforms um, and software and others and and computationally, I think there's um, 
and a lot of my colleagues are thinking about these things as well, like how do we make sense of them, how do we produce rigorous objects using them, how do we um, produce meaning, how do we uh, read them, how do we, you know, all kinds of questions uh, that are truly that come from a kind of confusion of what do we do with these tools um, and how do they be become part of our stable way of working in, in our discipline, architecture. So. So this is one way that I like to approach teaching, um, and I do it on many levels. Like I'll I'll do it in an advanced seminar, and we take it on with advanced students, um, like post professional master students or other, um, in a kind of specific way. Or I'll take it on, even in studio, on a on a less perhaps um, a specific way, but more about day to day workflows um, and routines of how we make up. Uh, uh, a form or, 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 or how do we develop spatial ideas or how do we even develop um, intent when we work or things like that um, and truly just understanding that that having you know a pen and a piece of paper is is going to produce very different kinds of things than toggling in uh, in Rhino really and zooming in and out really um, so those conversations emerge in studio at in first year at core level, for example. Um, there's also another kind of side to the coin. Um, in our practice, we're also really interested, and that's something that John and I started kind of like bonded over the, the very beginning of our collaboration, um, which is essentially just um, the contemporary, the politics of our day-to-day -day life. Um, how do we live? Um, how do we live individually? How do we live collectively? Um, how does that translate uh, into a kind of way of working, into plan, into forms, uh, into aesthetic projects? Well, as architects, we need to kind of rethink the brief um, and perhaps take it seriously um, so that we can be part of culture and participate in culture and, and not just receive culture. <laughs>